In this video number five on multivariable calculus challenge problems, I decided I wanted to have some fun. Hmm, how can that go together? Multivariable calculus challenge problems, and here we're using this program called Mathematica. How can I possibly have some fun with that? Well, don't, don't run away here. Stay with me. Let me whet your appetite for the little bit of fun we're going to have by showing you the most fun part right away. We're going to be looking at uh, problems 100 and 101 modified from the multivariable calculus book by Rogowski and Adams. And right away I want to show you the animation that this problem is related to. It's about, well, a water skiing moose. Here's my water skiing moose. Of course it didn't have to be a moose. But this tractrix curve, which is what you see in red here, would be the path followed by a water skier in this kind of setup where that black line that you see is the rope and it stays a fixed length and stays taut, no slack in that rope. What would happen if the boat starts moving perpendicular to the direction of the rope of the rope right away? The moose will follow a tractrix curve. So I hope that whets your appetite enough to want to follow the math that we're about to do. This math is kind of complicated, but I think it's worth learning. It involves what are called hyperbolic functions. And uh, maybe you've never worked with hyperbolic functions before. Maybe you've worked with them just a little bit. I want to try to convince you that they are useful. And this program, Mathematica, is also useful in helping us do calculations with these things because if you try to do this by hand, it really does end up being a pain. I, I initially thought of doing this by hand, but I started doing the calculations and I'm like, oh boy, this is so much writing. Let's have this program, Mathematica, do the calculations for me. But if you're really into this, I would encourage you to try to check these calculations by hand. So it's a three-part problem. Part A says verify this, that this tractrix curve given by this parametric equation here. This could be thought of as being a moving point. x as a function of time is t times l. This is an l here. What's this? Tanch. Yeah, that is tan. That h is no typo there. This is tanch. Hyperbolic tangent is the more official name of t divided by l. That's the x-coordinate of the moving point, the x-coordinate of the water skiing moose. And then we have L. L, by the way, is the length of the rope times, what's this? Sech? Yes, sech. Hyperbolic secant of T over L. That's the Y coordinate of the water skiing moose, where again, L is the length of the rope. Show that it has the following property for all T, for all time. The line segment, which was going to be the rope from C of T, where the water skier is, to t comma zero, where the boat is, is tangent to the curve of motion, the tractrix curve, and has length l, so the rope stays a fixed length. B, show that c of t, or more precisely, it's um, y and x coordinates when you, uh, well, when you divide the derivatives of those, satisfies this differential equation, dy dx equals negative y over square root of l squared minus y squared. So the curve itself, if you ignore time, satisfies that differential equation, and that's got a geometric interpretation. And part c, which is really the modification from what Wagrowski and Adams had in their book, I want to find the speed as a function of time and the distance traveled as a function of time for the water skier and graph them and think about why they make sense. So before we can get into this, we should talk about hyperbolic functions. What are they? Well, they're really linear combinations of exponential functions. This Mathematica code, if I enter this, this trig to exp command can expand these hyperbolic functions in terms of exponential functions. Hyperbolic sine or cinch, for example, is this function, which oftentimes is written as one fraction and oftentimes written as e to the x minus e to the negative x all over two. That's the hyperbolic sine or cinch function. The hyperbolic cosine or cosh function is this, which is often written as one fraction, e to the x plus e to the negative x all over two. The ratio cinch divided by cosh gives you tanch, the hyperbolic tangent function, which can be written this way. Oops, not all those ways, this way right there. Uh, the hyperbolic cosecant function is one divided by the hyperbolic 
sine function, so it's this. The hyperbolic um, secant function, these are not really linear combinations of exponentials, they are reciprocals of those things, is this. And the hyperbolic cotangent function is the reciprocal of the hyperbolic tangent. It's this function right there. So they're exponentials. So you might wonder why do we use trigonometric kind of notation, sine, cosine, etc. Well, because they share similar kinds of properties with trig functions. And in fact, if you get into what's called complex analysis with complex functions, you can see that these things are all very intimately related when the input is a complex number. Anyway, you can also see that their derivatives follow similar kind of patterns. The derivative, which is indicated by the d here, of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine, just like the derivative of sine is cosine. Gets a little different with the derivative of hyperbolic cosine. The derivative of hy hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine, not negative hyperbolic sine. Of course, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, but the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is positive hyperbolic sine. So it's, a, it's similar, but it's a little bit different. The derivative of hyperbolic tangent is the square of hyperbolic secant, just like the derivative of tangent is secant squared. The derivative of hyperbolic cosecant is negative cotan hyperbolic cotangent times hyperbolic cosecant. Uh, the derivative of hyperbolic secant is this. The derivative of hyperbolic cotangent is this similar kind of patterns as you see with derivatives of regular trig functions. They satisfy similar kinds of identities, except they're a little different. Instead of the sum of these squares being one, the difference of them is one. The difference hyperbolic cosine squared minus hyperbolic sine squared simplifies to one. One minus hyperbolic tangent squared is hyperbolic secant squared. One minus hyperbolic secant squared is hyperbolic tangent squared. And the sum of tang hyperbolic tangent squared plus hyperbolic secant squared is always one. You should take the time to verify all these properties, okay? If you really want to understand what's going on here, maybe make graphs of these things as well. All right, now let's go on to the problem at hand. So what I've got here are the functions of interest that I can enter into Mathematica. I've got my x-coordinate of my water skiing moose as a function of time. That comes from the problem statement right there. The y-coordinate is right there. I'm entering that function with this code right here. And then I combine them as a point in Mathematica. That's a list using curvy braces. Don't worry about that if you don't have Mathematica. I also like adding vectors in here. This is the velocity vector, which is the derivative of the position vector, and the acceleration, which is the second derivative of the position vector. If you don't know about vectors, it's OK. We'll just see what they are when we look at the pictures. I can enter this code, turn through these functions. I can enter this code to enter these, these, gra these um, pictures here. And then this code that we saw with the water skier allows me to see those pictures, this graphics and inset allow me to see the water skier and the speedboat. I can also make lines and arrows for vectors and my parametric curve with parametric plot to ultimately see this animation again. And once again, we see that as time goes on, indicated by this B increasing, the boat is moving and pulling the water skier. That rope has got to stay taut in order for the water skier to truly follow the Tractrix curve. The red, or the, um, excuse me, the magenta pink arrow there, that is the velocity vector for the moose. The greenish arrow there, that is the acceleration vector for the moose, the water skier. I can also change the length of the rope, by the way. I can increase the length of the rope or decrease it. But for any fixed length of the rope, um, the water skier will then follow the tractrix curve. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be a water skier. It could be a tractor pulling something along. And it's, again, this, this distance has to stay constant. It's got to be taut, no slack in it. All right, now let's actually solve the problem. What does part A ask for? Part A asks us to show that the length of the segment from C of T, where the water skier is, to T comma zero, where the boat is, stays a constant length. It has length L. Okay, this code 
um, defines the displacement vector, if you will, from the water skier to the boat. This is an arrow that would represent the line segment that was black going from the moose to the boat. You can see it's got that formula. You can simplify that yourself. And if I find the sum of the squares of those things, the x and y coordinates of the displacement here, and simplify it, it simplifies down to L squared. Therefore, the square root of that would be L. And that means the length of that line segment would stay constant at L because the square root of this sum of squares would be the length of the line segment. It's the length of the vector that I defined here with this displacement. This displacement represents that vector. I didn't draw it in the picture other than just as a black line segment, but this is algebraic verification that that length stays constant at L. Take the square root of L squared. What's part B? Part B is to show that C of T satisfies this differential equation. In other words, when we compute dy dx, and when we compute these, this thing as functions of T based on the parameterization, we should get the same thing. And we've seen in preceding videos that um, dy dx can be computed as the ratio of y prime divided by x prime, or if you prefer dy dt divided by dx dt. This code is going to compute y prime, x prime, y prime divided by x prime, and it's going to simplify it. It's also going to simplify the right-hand side, this thing here, when you plug in y of t and in this spot and in this spot. And what do we see? We see here is y prime. You should check that. Here's x prime. You should check that. Here's y prime divided by x prime, but that can be simplified using one of the identities that we saw, and it can ultimately simplify to negative um, hyperbolic cosecant. The right-hand side of the differential equation simplifies initially to this, but that's not as simple as it can be. Mathematica is not quite simplifying that as much as it could because it could take the square root of this. It, I think the problem is it doesn't know what L is, whether it's positive or negative or whatever. Um, it's not simplifying it completely, but we can take the square root of that. We know L is positive. We can replace the square root of L squared with L instead of the absolute value of L, for example, and we can simplify this and it does simplify to the same thing that dy dx simplified to, negative hyperbolic cosecant of t over l. That's what this simplifies to. That verifies that it satisfies the differential equation. What does that mean geometrically? Coming back to the picture, it means that the slope of this curve, say right here, is equal to the negative of the ratio y which is the height of this triangle, divided by square root of L squared minus Y squared, which is the length of this leg of the triangle. Remember, this line segment right there is, has got a constant length of L. That's what we saw in part A. So by the Pythagorean theorem, this is a right triangle here. We know this side has length Y. This side has got to have length square root of L squared minus Y squared. So what the differential equation is saying is the slope is given by the negative of that ratio, which it is, you can see from the picture. And again, the key thing is the fact that L stays constant. Okay, that's a geometric interpretation of what it means to solve that differential equation. Finally, part C, find the speed as a function of time and the distance traveled as a function of time for the moose on the, that's being pulled by the boot, boat, excuse me. The speed, it turns out, can be found to be the square root of the dot product of the velocity vector with itself. Um, I could have done that in terms of uh, the x prime and y prime, but I used the dot for a dot product here. Don't worry about that if you don't know what it is. Here's a formula for it. Uh, that can be simplified to just, by taking the square root to just this, or just the absolute value. That, though, um, for positive t, this is going to be positive anyway. What is the integral of that? It would be this. Um, and if this ha is a function whose graph goes through the origin when t is 0, that would actually be the distance traveled function. Integrating the speed will give you the distance traveled up to an additive constant. But that expression does go through the origin. If you plug in t equals 0 uh, into that, turns out cosh of 0 is 1, but the natural log of 1 is 0. L-O-G here actually means natural log in Mathematica. And so therefore, this, this expression here does represent the distance traveled as a function of time I can enter it. And now I can plot these things 
distance traveled, speed as functions of time. I plotted a few other functions here, t, t minus l log 2, and 1, because they do have some meaning here. Here's the picture. So the red graph is the graph of the speed as a function of time, and notice that's related to the constant function 1 here. This is the, the red graph is the speed of the moose, the water skier, as it is pulled. And the moose starts out with the speed of 0. At time 0, it's not moving. Um, the boat is assumed to have a, an initial non-zero velocity, but the moose is not. The moose speeds up, and the speed of the moose heads toward 1, which was the speed of the boat, one unit of distance per unit of time. I didn't specify what the unit of distance was. Okay, the boat was moving to the right um, at one unit of distance per unit of time. So the moose, is, his speed is approaching the boat speed, which makes sense. Okay, and the blue curve is the graph of the distance traveled. It's the integral of the speed. The derivative of the blue curve is equal to the red curve. And you can see the blue curve does appear to be approaching a straight line, and that's indicated by the dashed cyan colored line here which is cyan, that is t minus l times log of 2, and that's, remember, that's natural log, actually. You might wonder, why is that the slanted asymptote of the, of the uh, distance traveled function? I'll let you think about that. You can think about it based on this formula, where, again, log means natural log. Cosh of x, remember, was e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. That's all related. Use a property of logarithms. Think about what happens when t is large. That can help you figure out why this function, t minus l times natural log of 2, is a slant asymptote, as you see here. And we see this green line, which is just t. t really is the distance traveled by the boat. Okay, And so the moose, which is the distance traveled for the moose, is the dark blue line there, of course, never catches up to the boat as far as distance traveled goes. It's always L units away, uh, slanted, at a slanted distance. And as far as distance traveled goes, in the limit as t goes to infinity, the distance between the blue and dashed green graphs approaches L. And I can make L bigger or smaller, just like before. Okay, you can see the graphs that change are the red, blue, and dashed cyan graphs. I hope it all makes sense. I hope that was worthwhile. Um, Mathematica is a really cool tool for helping you solve things like this.